If you guys will just pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. Lord, we ask you to touch our hearts, Lord. We ask you to minister to us, Lord. We ask that your spirit, Lord, would, would stir us up from the inside out, Lord. Lord, we're ready for you to shape us, Lord. We're ready and we're willing, Lord. We're here saying that we're all in, Lord. We choose in, Lord. We choose into everything that you have for us, Lord. Through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, Lord, we choose in, Lord. Give us the strength to say yes. Give us the strength to surrender. Give us the strength to trust. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would minister to us tonight, that it be your words ministering to our hearts, Lord, your truth spoken over us, Lord. We pray for transformation. We pray for new life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, last week we talked a little bit about life, talked a little bit about life and about life being a journey. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know we got a lot of people here tonight that didn't hear the message last week, and um, I'll I'll recap a little bit because I think it's significant, Um, and we're going to continue to build on that. We feel like right now God has us as a family in a season of growing in our relationship with God. And we all could use a little growth. (laughs) We all could use a little growth. We all could use a little transformation. We all could use a little help. The most mature Christian would say, man, I have have probably the most to grow. And the person who's the newest at what we're doing here, this life we call Christianity, this family we call the church, the newest person is probably here just as hungry. And if you're caught somewhere in the middle, we pray that you find one end or the other, that you find that crazy insatiable hunger to grow or the crazy humility just to to recognize that you've, even as far as you've grown, you still have more to grow. So last week we talked about this concept of life being a journey. One thing that's interesting, I think that um, so often we get caught up focused on a destination, you guys know what I'm talking about? We're looking, the, in life, we're looking for where we're going to get. And we miss the whole journey. But really, in, in our faith and in, in the walk, we believe that life is all about the journey. Life is all about the journey. See, it's not about the events. It's not about the problems. It's not about the struggles. It's not about the trials. It's not even about the destination, but it's about the journey. And see, God has purpose for us in the journey. And what's important probably I think one of the most important things is our perspective. Our perspective is our point of view, the way that we think and respond and the attitude that we have as we're on that journey. See, God's got purpose in the journey for each of us. For each of you, God's got purpose on your journey. In the highs and the lows, the ups, the downs, in the wins and in the losses, God has purpose. And his purpose is to grow you. His purpose is to mature you. His purpose is to bring you in a little deeper into relationship with you. He, he wants to bring you in to what he's doing. He wants to shape your perspective. He wants to grow your perspective. We keep talking about that tonight, about our hearts and opening our hearts and softening our hearts. And we keep talking about... You know, we sing a lot about love, and we talk a lot about love, and and we like to think that we model love, that we demonstrate love in the way that we act, the way that we converse, the way that we are with one another. It's because, ultimately, we're seeking the one true giver of love, Jesus Christ. And that's what he calls us to in this world. He says the greatest thing that you could do is to love God. That's the first, that's the foremost, that's the most significant thing is to love God, and then it's to love others. So we're all on this journey together. And as we learn the truth about who God is, about who we are, and about the love that God has for us, it helps to shape our perspective on that journey. As we learn the truth. It makes the, the world a little easier. And you'll hear us talk about truth a lot. We, we like to think that we're preaching the truth. We're preaching the word of God. But we live in a world that lies to us. 
We live in a world that's full of lies. We live in, in a world that, that has relationships that are built on lies. We live in a world that has so many lies that we can't even trust each other. Even in this room, we have a hard time trusting because of the lies that we believe. You guys know what I'm talking about? Do you know these lies? Do I need to even, ta- even explain them? I think it's important for us, though, to recognize where they come from. Um, I'm going to read a passage, a, a verse from John. John chapter 8, verse 44. This is Jesus speaking here, and he's talking to his disciples. I take that back. He was talking to his disciples in the previous verse. In this verse, he's talking to a group of people that were seeking to kill him. (laughs) The opposite of his disciples. (laughs) Really glad I clarified that. (laughs) In verse 44, he says to these people, he says, You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar. He is the father of lies. Where do lies come from? Come from the pit of hell. Come from the devil himself. And if we do not have the right perspective when we hear those lies, then what are we going to do? If we don't realize where they're coming from, then we're going to take them, we're going to own them, we receive them. And lies can be as simple as, I'm not good looking. You know? (laughs) Kind of have to go there now, huh? (laughs) That wasn't in my notes. But you know what the truth is that God fashioned you, that God made you, that every freckle, that every hair, everything that we in the world would call a mistake is actually character that he's fashioned into your being. And each one of us, when he looks at us, he sees a wonderfully, beautifully crafted human. He sees us as perfect. He sees us as beautiful guys, handsome. (laughs) He sees us all as good looking. And we get this lie stuck in our head that I'm, I'm, I don't look good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not capable enough. You know what? The capacity that we have to do things in this world is the capacity that God gave us. And for us to say, I, I'm not capable enough to do X, Y, and Z, would be to say that God messed up, that God made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. God was perfect when he crafted each and every one of us. Those are just some personal lies that we can get caught up on really wasn't going to talk about lies tonight but I think it's important that we know where they come from and I wanted to communicate a couple of them to you because I'm sure that each of you could list a hundred or a thousand or a million lies we hear them all the time every day and so often even within this room we find ourselves repeating lies back to each other because it's such a part of this world that we live in But we need to be counteracting those lies. We need to be combating those lies. We need to be coming against them. And when you have a lie stuck in your head, what would be the most appropriate thing to come against that lie with? The truth. The truth. Absolutely. And as we learn the truth, we will have victory. Our struggles won't be perceived as struggles they were they will be perceived as opportunities to grow see when we learn the truth it gives us confidence to get through the day whether it's an amazing wonderful incredible day or whether it's 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 a day that's just dragging on and won't end when we know the truth we can keep moving forward we can keep growing we can keep pushing in to this life that God has for us And when we know the truth, everything's okay. It makes everything okay. See, it's the truth that dispels lies. And when that lie is resounding in your head, you bring the truth, and what happens? That lie has no place to go. It's like turning the lights on in a dark room. The darkness flees. And that's the potential that we have. That's the capacity that we have. 
So as we grow in this relationship, this journey of life, as we come to understand the truth, as we come to have a right perspective on the things that are happening in our life, God grows us, and he grows in us an ability to trust him, really to trust God. We talk about faith a lot. We've been teaching on faith. Actually, before we were talking about rest, we were teaching on faith. And that concept, that, that trust, that confidence coupled with action. And trust is a part of that. Trust is, is, is one of the ingredients of faith. But it's a main ingredient. And we've got to be able to trust God. But why is that hard? Why is that hard? It's hard because so often we look at our relationship with God with God and we come to him as it were, as if it were just another relationship in life. And the relationships that we have, the relationships that we share, even the best relationships are are riddled with brokenness. They're imperfect. I love my wife to death, and I would I would fight to say that we have an incredible relationship is the best relationship with, in my life. But I couldn't say that it's perfect. We're real. We go through our highs and our lows. And, and man, you know what? We struggle just like everybody to love each other. We struggle to, to accept each other, to understand each other. Man, I, you know, I have to be careful what I say. Relationships can be complicated. <laughs> and, and sometimes, and my wife tells me all the time, she's like, you didn't say that. And I'm like, yes, I did. And she says, no, you didn't say that. And then we get down to it and we realize that even the words that I said when they were coming out of my mouth was not what she, she heard the words, but they resonated differently in her heart. She, she thought I was saying something totally different. And you guys know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> so I, I would love to say that my wife and I have a perfect relationship, and that's our heart. That's our desire, but, man, it's not perfect. No no relationship is perfect except God. God's love for us is perfect. We can trust him fully. We're going to mess up on our end of the bargain. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short, and he knows that. But his grace is bigger than all of our mistakes. There's not a mistake that we could make that he can't forgive. There's nothing that we could do that would cause him to turn his back on us. He loves us that much. And his love is that perfect. His love is that real. A few verses before the one that I, I, the last verse I just read, also in John chapter 8. Jesus is speaking. And he says, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my desire, my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm going to read that again. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's like worship prepared us perfectly for this moment. How many of us want freedom? How many of us want freedom? How many of us know that we have exactly what we need to find freedom. How many of us would say we're walking in that and we're walking in total freedom? We don't have as many hands up. And that's okay because it's all about the journey. You guys, this is about the journey and this is what God's doing. Last week, I said something about this book. This is the Bible. I believe it's the word of God. With all my heart, I believe this is the word of God. I believe that he used man to write it, but it's every word on here is his word to us. I believe it's perfect. I believe it's infallible. I believe there's nothing wrong with it. I believe that it's God's word for us. And for so many years of my life, I studied this book as a how-to manual. And I came to it because I want, I'm a to-do guy, list guy. I'm a list guy. I'm a, I make to-do lists. I make you know, I, my 
10 things I got to do today. That's just how I am. And I came to the Bible like another to-do list. How do I got to live my life, God? This was my how-to manual. It was the basic instruction manual before leaving earth, you know, the B-I-B-L-E. We all know the song. We should break out in song right now, right? No, we won't. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But the Lord showed me that the Bible is more than all of that. It does give us instruction. Yeah, it does tell us how to live life. But at its core, it's a romance novel. At the core of this book, it's a romance novel. It's a story of God's love for humanity. It's a story of how he wants to engage humanity in relationship. It's a story of his love for us. And it's a story of how we can love him, how we can trust him, how we can come to him, what we can ask of him. And when the Lord said that to me, I was tripping out. Because I was never one of those guys that read romance novels. (laughs) This Bible is the truth. And this Bible tells us about God's love for us and God's love for humanity. And when we open it and read it, I gave you guys a challenge last week. I said, just open it up. And read it and ask God to show you how this is a story about his love for us. How it's a love story. A romance novel. Did anybody get to do that last week? Moment of truth. I love it. Well, let's do it right now. How about that? Matthew chapter 7. I'm just going to give you a little for example so that y'all don't think I'm crazy. Those of you who really know me, nothing I could say would change your mind. That's okay. So if you've never read the Bible and if you're thinking I'm crazy and you want a place to start, I just say start with Matthew. I love the book of Matthew. I love the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're four books that were written to tell the story of Jesus' life while he lived it here on earth. So if, you've, if you're looking for the romance novel, if you're looking for God's interaction, his love for humanity, one of those books would be a great place to start. And Matthew is a really good one. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Jesus is speaking and he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. And then Jesus goes on. He tells a little story. He says, for which of you, which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked him for a fish, would give him a serpent? If you, then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things? To his children. Okay. What do we learn about God's love for humanity there? What do we see? What does that little story, what do those four or five verses tell us about God and his interaction with humanity, his interaction with us? He wants to give us good things. Right? He wants to give us good things. How many have ever doubted that what God has given you in life is good? It's okay, we could raise our hand. (laughs) Many a moments. And if we were real, every one of us would have our hands up. And that's okay. But see, God, when we're looking to him, he always gives us good things when we ask him. And all he wants us to do is ask him. All he wants us to do is ask him. And this same book, this Bible, is the book that we would come to to learn how to grow in our relationship with God. This tells us the truth about what we can expect from God. It tells us the truth about how we can come to God, what we can ask of God. And here in these scriptures, what does he say? Ask and it will be given. There's, there's no parameters. There's no conditions on that. In this scripture, he says, ask and it will be given. He says, seek and you will find. 
Knock and it will be opened to you. And then he, he shows how we, in our love as fathers, as parents in this world, we desire to give good things to our children. We're made in his image. Of course we would want to give good things to our children. Every relationship requires communication. And God wants communication with us. God wants us to communicate with, us, with him. He wants us to be in conversation with him. And there's this little thing that the Bible talks about in communication with him called prayer. Have you guys heard of prayer? <laughs> prayer is a funny thing. And the way that we pray is a funny thing. And how we pray is a funny thing. And it comes in all different shapes and forms and all different sizes and all different volumes and all different words. And, but in its simplest form, what is prayer? Conversation. Conversation. What does every good conversation have? Words. Listening. Two people. Some of us talk to ourselves, but that's not real conversation. <clears throat> I mean, I guess you could argue that. The Holy Spirit inside and conversing. And... Conversation is two ways, right? Con how many of us come to God only when we have dire needs? How many of us come to him only with requests? I love your honesty, Tamario. It blesses my heart. Some of, you know, how many of us only call our friends when we need something? My friends are pointing at me in the room. You, Dave. <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> but how often do we call a friend just to say hi for no reason at all? Just to say, how you doing? I wanted to check in. And how often when we call our friend do we say, how was your day? And let them share with us. How often do we call a friend and say, hey, let me share with you about my day? Jesus teaches us to pray. If we flip back a chapter in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. They're wanting to learn from him, and he says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. But I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray with your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And he goes on, he gives us an example. I don't know, we might spend a few weeks on prayer. So much, it's so deep. The conversation and the, com the ability that we have to communicate with God is so rich. And so many of us just scratch the surface. When I read this, there's two things that really, really stand out that just resound in my ears. At first glance, I say, when it, say, when it says, but when you pray, go to your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. At first glance, I ask the question, what? I don't know secrets in my life. I don't want to be secretive. What God is saying is that he wants to be intimate with us. He wants the one-on-one -on -one conversation. He wants to bring us in. He wants us to find that place where we can just be with him, where we can get intimate, and he wants us to be conversational. He wants us to have a conversation. He says, don't heap up empty words. What is he saying? Meaningless. That mean nothing, wrote, routine, repeated. He doesn't want us to, to just come to him with these 
say the same thing over and over and over again, it's fine in our relationships with our friends. Oftentimes we talk about things again, over and over again, and that's okay. It's okay to talk about the same thing with God. But he doesn't want us to, to get in that pattern of just that route repetition just over and over the same words. God wants us to be real. He wants us to be intimate. He wants us to engage in a conversation with him. And when we read this, this romance novel, when we read this love story, that's what we get to see. We get to see his heart for humanity and his love for us. And I love the, the last verse I read there. Verse 8 says that your father knows what you need before you ask him. How many people in this room have read that before? How many people, honestly, I mean, how many people have ever thought, why should I ask him if he already knows what I need? I've had that thought. I've wondered, why the heck would I ask God if he already knows? Any of you ever have a friend in need? And you know they need help. You know that they're stuck. You know they're in a sticky situation. And you know you got what they need. But you're not going to just go and, and enable them, right? You're not going to go just do it for them. You, you want to wait for that phone call. You want to wait for them to get to the point where, where they want the help. Where they ask you for it. God's love for us is perfect. And, and a lot of times, when we know that our friends have need, we... We might wait and not go help them for the wrong reasons. <laughs> but that's not God. See, God knows what we need when we need it. But he wants to be in conversation with us. He wants to be in relationship with us. See, it's all about relationship. For God, it's all about relationship. It's not about coming to church on Sunday, week after week, year after year. It's not about reading the Bible from start to finish. Those, those are perks. Those are bonuses. Those are, those are joys that we get to experience in the relationship. But they're not requirements. Do your friends require you to call them every day, every minute? Don't answer that question. Because <laughs> we all have those friends. One of my favorite, I'd say, life verses is Philippians. Chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God wants us to come to him. He doesn't want us to go through life anguishing, sorrowful, guilty, just burdened with condemnation or, or, or shame. He doesn't want us to go through like broken. He wants to heal us from the inside out. He wants to make us new. And I love this verse right here because it says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything. In everything by prayer. With thanksgiving, you let your request be made known. And there's a promise. It's the next verse. It says, in the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your heart your mind, and your soul. That's his promise. See, he says, ask me, and I'll give it to you. Seek, and you're going to find it. Knock, and the door is going to be open. Remember, he's a good father, and he gives us exactly what we need. So when we ask the things that we don't need, he knows we don't need those things. Every relationship requires trust. And God wants us to trust him. And he wants us to trust him with everything. There's nothing in our life that God cannot be trusted with. 
But all those things that we hold on to, that we refuse to let go of, that we keep to ourselves or that we don't trust God with, are areas that he allows us the freedom to hold on to. He allows us the freedom to continue on in. It's like a, a bad relationship, one that you knew months ago it was done and it was over. And we, but just for whatever reason, I'm not going to let go of this relationship. No matter how much it hurts inside or outside, there's just, there's brokenness and God loves you enough to say, if that's a relationship you want to have in your life, then I'm going to let you have that relationship. He calls that free will. He gives us free will to make those decisions. But God has for us something that's so much greater than the things that we want for ourselves. And he tells us also in this word, in this love story, he tells us, he tells us to seek him. To seek the heavenly things, to seek his kingdom, to seek his will, his desire in our life. And a lot of times that takes us letting go. That takes us choosing in, that takes us saying yes, that takes us surrendering. And those are some hard words. They're words that in my own life, when I thought I had fully surrendered, an event or a situation in life would come up. And like God was just showing me something else I could surrender, something else he wanted me to let go of. And I know those things when they come up in my life because my heart shifts, my attitude shifts, my words to others shift, my actions change. And I recognize there's something going on in my heart. See, life's all about the journey. And those ups and downs, those events, the good ones and the bad ones, God wants to teach us. He wants to grow us. He wants to mature us. He wants to change us. And all we got to do is say yes. All we got to do is be willing. I'm going to have the worship team come up. I want to encourage you guys to be reading the word of God for yourselves. I want to encourage you to read it and to pick it up and not to read it and ask, how do I live my life? But read this word and ask God to teach you about the relationship that he wants with you. Ask him to teach you about his love. Ask him to give you the ability to trust him. It's easy. It's fun. It's scary. But it's the greatest thing promise you it'll be the greatest thing you've ever done learning to trust God and Jesus never lets us down our God never ever ever lets us down I want to encourage you this week to pray I want to encourage you guys just to talk to God find that opportunity just to communicate with him And in your conversation with him, remember, my mom always said, you know, Dave, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. God wants you to spend twice as much time listening. I think that God would have that for us in our our time of prayer, to spend time listening and asking him to speak to us. Last week, we talked about relationships and the importance of relationships. And I'd recommend that not a one of you go out of this room without getting somebody else's phone number that you didn't have before. Take some time. Be intentional. Be intentional to engage in relationship. God gives us relationships with each other. And they're just as necessary for our growth and maturity. They're just as necessary in life as our relationship with our Heavenly Father. There's a a room full of people that are seeking the same thing. And if we all lock arms and we charge together in the battle, we are sure to be victorious. Let's engage in relationship. And let's engage in worship together. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we praise you for your love. We thank you and praise you for your truth, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord, that love story that you left us so that we could know about your love for us, Lord. 
Would you stir our heart to pray, Lord? Stir up in our heart a burden to have a conversation with you. And would you teach us about prayer, Lord? Would you give us faith to trust you, to believe you, and to surrender our all to you? Would you meet us, Lord, right where we're at? In Jesus' name, amen.